And okay, we are. I have titled this one <clears throat> "The History of Jerusalem." Season 3, Episode 1, The Birth of the Crusades. Now, you may be asking yourselves, I don't understand why the rabbi in mid-February changed this to Season 3. And there's a no good calendar reason for me to change it to Season 3, but there is a an amazing reason for me to, to delineate this subject as a completely new moment in time. And that is because the Crusades are going to represent an enormous change in the way in which the, the world functions and in the way in which the Jews will live under the Christians. So let's, because this is the history of Jerusalem, let's start with the Jerusalem connection. The Crusaders will conquer Jerusalem on June 7th, 1099. And that's probably going to be the last time I mention Jerusalem in terms of something happening in Jerusalem for the next couple of weeks. But there's no question that Jerusalem is part of the, the idea, it is part of the draw, it's part of the drive to, um, for the Crusaders. But in truth, you'll forgive the crass uh, iconography, but we have to go back in time. And... We're going back in time to the origin of the Crusades. And the origin of the Crusades happens work on... Hold on one work called 9 o'clock. Okay. The, the call to the Crusades happens on in November. There's a, Essentially, the Council of Claremont is about 10 days in November in the year 1095. And at this Council of Claremont, we know that Pope Urban II calls Christians to arms. And he calls on them to, he calls for a holy war to liberate the holy land from the infidel. We actually don't know the exact speech that Pope Urban II used when he called Christians to arms on that fateful day. In November of 1095. Uh, we don't even know if he actually mentioned the word Jerusalem. What we do know <clears throat> is that he was very interested in gathering a carefully organized military force under papal control. And we also know that no such thing ever happened. That the Pope never controlled the, uh, the armies and he lost control of what was, was going on. And it was meant to be that there were clerics who would travel with the armies and control them. There was only one cleric who actually controlled an army, and that was Peter the Hermit. Um, and he was particularly bad for the Jews. But perhaps we'll do more on Peter the Hermit in a future installation. But we still have to go back in time, maybe just... A little bit further to understand what's really going on. So again, the bad back to the future um, piece. And what we're sort of after a little bit is what is, inspires the Crusades. What really gets it going? What makes the what makes the Crusades in? What was it that inspired the Pope to call on a holy war to liberate the infidels um, and specifically to to do so in in Jerusalem? And so this map that you're about to see is absolutely central to this discussion. Now, this is a map, if you look at it, it is a map of how the Islamic world expands. So, it is very small on this, and I apologize for that. Um, you will actually see it a little bit larger in, a, in just a little while. The Islamic world under Muhammad in the, in the 7th century, 622, 632, that's the orange at the center. And then 632, 661, that's the territory added by the, the caliphs. And if you've been part of our history of Jerusalem, you know that, that the, the Muslims took advantage of the Persian and Jewish, uh, sorry, the Persian Christian conflict, and they, they swept in when Byzantium and, um, and the Persians were weak. And they man managed to, to secure Jerusalem. But the Muslims also began to expand outwards um, into Egypt, into um, 
Tunisia, Morocco, and they pushed out Christians there. And maybe the two most important places for us to see where Christians were displaced were specifically in the Iberian Peninsula, which is now Spain, and in addition, Sicily. Sicily is conquered in 902, right? So that now we have lands that we always associate with Christian Europe that have been conquered by, by Muslims. And the Christians, um, when they are conquered by the Muslims, they are not unified. There's a lot of squabbling. There are sort of these little fiefdoms. It's almost sort of, it's almost tribal. Not quite, but, but it is certainly not coordinated. And the, the, the sort of the encroachment of the Muslim world on the Christian world is believed to be part of this response. Part of the reason that the Crusades take place is because the infidels are now um, pushing their way into the Muslim world. And what's really important, I think, for us to, to understand is part of Christian theology is that God has favored the Christians, that really the success of Christianity is manifest. The, it, it manifests itself its veracity is manifest in the temporal world. That it has to be that since God favors the Christians, they also have to be victorious. And so the encroachment of the Muslims on the Christian world is a very serious issue. And so the purple, if you will, in this map has got to expand. It's got to push back. And the Crusades and the Pope conceives of this as a religious war um, happens at exactly this time, almost as a pushback against the Muslims. The other thing which begins to happen now is the Christian states begin to have real power. Um, and one of the things that, um, oops, um, that I wanted to show you here, just as we can, believe it or not, um, when I grew up, I grew up in, in Baltimore, and my parents used to take us to the Walters Art Gallery. And in the Walters Art Gallery, they had a museum of arms and armaments. And there was very ornate ar uh, armor and some really um, very decorative things. Those things all come sort of from the, the, the late Middle Ages Renaissance, uh, 16th century, maybe a little bit in the 15th century, uh, certainly the 17th century. But if you want to go find actual things that came from, from the, the 10th and 11th century, it's a little bit harder to find that. But there are, in various collections, the ones that I've brought from you here um, come from the Worcester Museum, the Royal Armories. Um, there's, uh, the British Museum seems to have a very nice collection of armor, but their images aren't available online. So anybody who's got any schlep with the, uh, with the British Museum, tell them that they should put their things online. But I wanted to give you a sense of you know, what were the armaments like. But it is at this point that Christian society becomes organized, starts to have a professional soldier class. We will get back um, in, in, a, in a short while to this professional soldier class and, and, the, and, the, um, and what's happening as well, specifically on the, on the borders of that, um, of that um, purple green border. The purple green border is the Christian Muslim border. And we're going to see how that may even be a strict precursor to the Crusades. That may be the that match that lights the fire that that Pope Urban II uh, seizes upon in order to to mobilize Christians to take back the Holy Land. But there's more to it than that. As well, at this time, the Holy Roman Empire is revived. You should know, by the way, <clears throat> that this is this particular. Um, uh, term, the Holy Roman Empire, is not used until the 13th century. <clears throat> it is either called the Holy Empire or the Roman Empire, um, but never the Holy Roman Empire until the 13th century. And uh, hopefully everybody remembers that, uh, I think it's a Seinfeld joke, or maybe it's a Friends joke. The Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Discuss? Yeah, it's true, but they conceived them themselves as such. And what I think is really important here is that when the Christians start to think of themselves as an empire. They start to think of themselves imperially. 
and the borders of that empire need to push out, and they need to push out in a religious fashion, that you have religious imperialists. And so this Holy Roman Empire begins with Charlemagne in 800, but the, the German emperor, Henry IV, is crowned as the emperor in 1084, the borders begin to expand, and this empire begins to conceive of itself as a tour de force, as something that needs to, to act as an empire acts. And so you have, once again, we have this very interesting border between the green and the purple, right? The green is the Muslim expansion and the purple is, is where the Christians are. And the Holy Roman Empire is right there in the center where we talk about the, uh, the kingdom of the Franks, right? Oops, I went one, one slide too far. The kingdom of the Franks. And so you have this tension between the Muslim world and and the Christian world. And that is, is, that is the political battle that is being fought. What is fascinating about this battle is that the battle also is, is, it's interesting how the Jews see themselves in this battle. This is the first Rashi on Breshit. Now, it's interesting how Rashi approaches this. You, you know, you, you're writing a commentary on the Torah. This is your very first entry. Page Jewish books always start on page 2. So it starts on page 2. This is what Rashi is telling us on page 2. He's saying, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak said, the Torah need not, uh, should say, start here, right? Um, but from this month is the first month, the first commandment given to Israel. Rashi essentially has, says the conception is that the Torah is a law book. So why should the Torah be beginning with, um, with the statement of, um, of creation. It should start with the laws. And Rashi's answer is, because the nations of the world would claim that the Jews stole the land. And the Jews can answer that the land belongs to the Holy One, blessed be He, for He created it, and He gave it to us, the Jews. Rashi, is, Rashi who is a, he's living at exactly this time, is telling you that there is a great struggle between who owns the Holy Land. And he is, in a way, he's staking his flag. You know, it's going to be another uh, um, 948 years or so, maybe it's just 900 years, until David Ben-Gurion is beginning to be able to say, yeah, we, we, we got it back. But Rashi is telling us that, that he is not bowing out. He and the rest of the Jews are not bowing We don't have an army. We don't have the power. We're not, we don't have a military horse in this race at the moment. But even though the, these two forces have, have, uh, have great military powers who are about to fight over this land, uh, Rashi is, is telling us that, uh, that we have a, a, a claim to stake as well. Now, the, we now come to, if you will, a bit of the Jewish question of of the Europe of the Crusades, and what ha- what's happening with this imperialist idea is that we have for the first time Christianity aims to uproot Judaism and Jewishness. It is more than just sort of a uh, um, sparks of individualized anti-Semitism. You have a concerted effort to uproot Jewishness. This is an extremely complicated concept. The reason it's an extremely complicated concept, and I decided not to go into it in great depth here because I really want to focus on the Crusades and what happened with them. But the Catholic Church had something called the Doctrine of Witness, which means that the Jews were not to be destroyed or forcibly converted. This is based on the teachings of St. Augustine. Augustine said that the Jews need to we need them because the Jews are a critical link. That in order for us Christians to prove the veracity of the New Testament, we have to have an unbroken chain from the Old Testament. And who are the stewards of the Old Testament? Who are the protectors of the Old Testament? It's the Jews. They are the they bear witness to the fact that there is a true Old Testament that God gave on Sinai. And we need them around. So if you get rid of all the Jews, we lose an important link. But that was a delicate balance because there was lots of anti-Semitic rhetoric 
in the in the Catholic theology, right? There was, if you remember back several lessons, there was the story of the True Cross that the Jews knew the power of the story of the True Cross. They knew the power of the True Cross, and the Jews hid the True Cross from from the Christians because the Jews were in fact the partners of Satan. the The whole idea, and we might need to spend some time on blood libel. The idea that Jews need to not just that we historically killed the Christian Savior, but that we in a continuous fashion continue to kill the Christian Savior. And in continuous fashion, we continue to kill innocents. And that is the very theme of the blood libel, that Jews are the murderers of innocents, both then in terms of Jesus and the cross and in the current, um, in the current phase with blood libels. And so there was this strain in this imperialist march forward that we are about to conquer um, not just not just the Holy Land, but we're going to get rid of infidels. And there are actually in some of the the <coughs> in some of the the history of the time, we have in the mouth of the Crusaders the following words. More or less, why do we need to wait till we get to the Holy Land to fight the infidel, the infidel exists in our backyard. And so they took this this, um, this battle to the Jews. This battle and the entire crusading mission may have actually been inspired by something that was very close to home, a war against the infidel, extremely close to home. And that is the Reconquista. Now, if you remember, I keep telling you that this battle is a battle between the purple and the green. The Muslim expansion into Spain and Sicily and the, and the Christian lands, the Kingdom of the Franks. So Fritz Baer, Yitzhak Baer, in a classic work, The History of the Jews of Christian Spain, he writes the following. He characterized the Reconquista of Spain as a holy war. And he writes... This is a qu direct quote from the book. The warriors of the Spanish Reconquest were fired by the same fanaticism which animated the Crusades. But the French knights who come to, to wage war in Spain do so in 1066. They start, the, the Reconquista of Spain happens in, happens 30 years before Pope Urban II ever gets up on that podium. 30 years before Urban II gets up on this podium to tell the, the Christians they have to organize in a holy war against the Muslims, the Christians are already in a holy war against the Muslims in Spain. And this particular, um, this particular pre-war, this little precursor to this, the Grander Crusade, we know that there, there, there's a tremendous amount of of emotional intellectual overlap, historical overlap between them. First of all, we have contemporary Hebrew poetry that tells us of the fiercely religious character of of the warfare. And we also learn about the fact that they were there was there was both slaughter and compulsory conversion of both Jews and Muslims. And so the the, the war against the infidel doesn't start when Urban II gets up on that podium in, in 10, 1095. It starts in 1066 when, when, the, uh, when the Jews of Spain are, are having a, are, are part of the Reconquista. Well, I shouldn't say part of the Reconquista. It starts in 1066 when the, the French and the Spanish begin to take Spain back from, from the Muslims. Jews are spared, interestingly, Jews are spared in the Reconquista, at least in the initial phase. Why? Because the, the Christians needed the Jews. They did not have the wherewithal to administer the cities, to do the accounting, um, to, to, uh, to manage the, the trade. They needed the Jews for all these essential functions. So Jews were spared because of, for very practical purposes. But one of the things you have to understand is that the Reconquista lasts until... The conquest of Grenada in 1492. The conquest of Grenada in, the, in 1492 is a very interesting year. 
right? This is the end of, of the Crusade of Spain. Now, I know this is supposed to be the history of Jerusalem. This is the end of the Crusade of Spain, but this is, this is pivotal because this is a war to uproot the infidel. And at the same time, it is a war to uproot Jewishness, right? And so you have the same imperialist drive and purifying spirit drives the Spanish Inquisition. And the Inquisition, its stated goal to, to identify heretics who had converted from Judaism and Islam to Catholicism. Right? It is the same war against the infidel, just done differently. Right? The, what else happens in the year 1492? Right, the Jews are expelled from Spain. This is the Spanish expulsion of Jews happens in that very same year. The idea that, that there is going to be an imperialist war to bring about a pure Christian state that is that is Judenrein, that is Muslim Rhine, that's what's happening. And so this is this is the very spirit that takes place in in 1090, in 1096, that they are going to uproot Jewishness. The route that the Crusaders take starts basically in France and Germany, and it moves through various, various lands until finally, three years later, it gets to Jerusalem. Now, I told you that the Pope anticipated creating an ecclesiastical army, you know, in the history of the world, nobody makes a speech like that um, um, without expecting that they're going to be able to gain power. The the Pope envisioned himself as as a being able to rule parts of the, the temporal world, and he assumed that he was going to have clerics and he was going to have bishops who were going to lead these armies and be part of the control, the tempering force, and the direction of this army. No such thing ever happened. There were various nobles that that put together their own armies and uh, they uh, they are um, they are a bit of a ragtag group and they are also unruly what I the place that I want to conclude today is perhaps one of the most riveting and bitter uh, stories that one could ever tell um, the story is happens in the German city of Mainz, although the truth of the matter is we could have picked any number of, uh, there are really three cities, um, Speyer, um, Worms, and Mainz are the three cities where the, these crusader armies um, um, visit violence in the days leading up to Shavuot in the year 1096. The what you're going to, what you're about to hear comes from a, um, a collection of he, the Hebrew Chronicles of the First Crusade. The Jews did not write any histories at all between, between the closing of the Bible and, and roughly the 11th, the 12th century. That's not quite true. Um, What's the exception? Josephus. Josephus and the Tanakh are both more or less um, finalized somewhere around the first century of the Common Era. And, and so between Josephus and at, between the time of Josephus and the, the canonization of, the, of Tanakh, I'm taking the date as the canonization, canonization of Tanakh, between those, between those dates, which happened between the first and the second centuries, there are, there is no appreciable history uh, um, written by the Jews until the, the Chronicles of the First Crusades, which says to us a number of things. And there's a brilliant book written by um, Professor Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, um, Alava Shalom, formerly of Columbia University, who, it's a book called Zachor, Jewish History and Jewish Memory. And he explores this issue and he basically says, look, Jews didn't need to write history um, because they had the Tanakh and they saw the Tanakh as, as a proto-history. It was sort of an archetype of history and everything fit into Tanakh. You didn't need to write anything new. History was considered a, a secondary discipline. 
But when the Crusades hit in, immediately, there were at least four different versions of histories of the, of the First and Second Crusades that appeared very quickly. And this, this signifies that Jews are starting to think about this time period as entirely different. Um, I just wanted to show you a page of what some of these things look like. This is the Lister's list of martyrs in Mines, May 27, 1096. Um, this book is available on Amazon. I happen to have a copy in my own library. It is, uh, it is really, I can't tell you that I've ever read anything that is more uh, piercing and heart-wrenching than these books. And I'm going to, uh, to read to you a rather lengthy section of this um, um, discussion. Just before I get to lengthy sections, so um, uh, Jonathan writes it here about Unas Anatokev. Uh, Unas Anatokev is a is a fascinating story, and we may it may be worthwhile doing a separate discussion about who was Rabbi Amnon and how the story of Unas Anatokev relates to the part of the story that the the Crusader Chronicles doesn't want to uh, discuss at all. Um, but that's a it's a you are correct that Unas Anatokev is part of this this um, to this um, passion to uproot Judaism. Um, Marcus writes about the fact that the Shapiros call come from the city of Shpire, right? Um, and that is their their place of origin. And so this is this is a mishpacha story for for the Shapiros. I will tell you also that my grandmother was a Vermzer, which means that I'm mishpacha to to the people in in Verms. And, you know, if you ever met a Jew named Mainzer or things like that, then probably they come from, from the city of Mainz. Okay, here goes the story. Just one piece of, uh, of vocabulary. Burgers uh, means uh, townsmen, um, and they, func they, f they figure into this, this story. I, I had originally uh, wanted to get a voice actor to read this so that it, it wasn't my voice droning on in this rather lengthy piece. Um, I, I'm, the, the truth of the matter is we could read this piece for a half an hour. I could annotate it and tell you all of the biblical references, all of, of the Talmudic references that are being overlaid into this. But I want you to just hear the story in terms of what is happening. I want you to think about how the story s creates a certain kind of self-conception. What is the what are the, um, the the individuals here? How do they see their own their own lives? Okay, so here's the story of Minds Anonymous. Um, and uh, actually, before I get into the actual reading, I'll just give you a little bit of background. The Crusaders again they come to the the city of Spire, and the the Jews of Spire are a little bit smart, and they decide to to scatter and hide, and so it's very hard to find them. And so, 11, unfortunately, only 11, unfortunately, 11 Jews died. Fortunately, it was only 11 Jews who died in the city of Shpire. There is a full-scale massacre in the city of Worms, and, and then it repeats itself in the city of Mines. The, the, the army is led by um, Emiko of Lanyen, Amico of Lanyen, you'll see that it, in the in this narrative, it's going to say of ground bones. When then the Jews refer to Amico of Lanyen, they say, "May his bones be ground to dust," because he he is he is the Hitler of their day. So, um, okay, I think that's enough background on on what's happening. They encamped outside the city for two days. The heads of the community said, let's send him money and give him our writ that other communities along the way should honor him. Perhaps God will act with his great kindness. For they had previously scattered their money among the bishop, the pasha and his officers, his servants, and the burghers, about 400 half coins, that they should help them, but it did not affect anything for them. It was the third day of Sivan, the day Moses said, be ready for three days that the crown of Israel fell, it was then that the Torah scholars fell, that the grape clusters ceased to exist, that the honor of the Torah and the radiance of wisdom ended. He threw the splendor of Israel from heaven to the ground. So the third day of Sivan is three days before Shavuot, 
and it's referring to the the three days before the, to- the Torah, the the commemoration of the giving of the Torah. It was midday that the evil Amiko of ground bones arrived with his entire army. The burghers opened the gates for them. God's enemies, Amiko's crusaders, said to one another, See, the gate opened on its own. The crucified is doing all this for us, that we may avenge his blood from the Jews. They came with their banners, a great army, numerous as the sand at the sea to the bishop's gate, where members of the Holy Covenant were. When the Holy Ones, those in awe of the Almighty, saw the great crowd, they trusted in and stuck to their Creator. They donned their shields and girded their weapons, young and old, with Rabbi Clonimus, the son of Rabbi Meshulam, at their head, a pious man, one of the greatest of the generation, our master, Rabbi Menachem, son of our master, Rabbi David Halevi, was there. He told all the assembled, hold on, wholeheartedly honor, by death if necessary, the honorable and awesome name. They all answered as had the sons of Yaakov when Yaakov wished to reveal to them the presence of God, real, reveal the end to them, the end of days. It's an end of days prophecy. But the presence of God left him. So he said, There is among my children a flaw, as there was among my grandfather Avraham and my father Yitzchak. And as had our ancestors answered when they accepted the Torah, at this time of year at Mount Sinai, saying, We will do and we will listen. Calling out in a great voice, Hear, O Israel, God is our God, God is one. And they all approached the gate to fight against the crusaders and the burghers. The two sods fought one another until sins had their effect and the enemies won. Capturing the gate and the bishop's men who had promised to help the Jews had previously fled, allowing them to be taken by the enemies. For the bishop's men were crushed reeds. Crushed reeds is actually a reference to Egypt, which is which Jeremiah said was like a crushed reed. And just what's happening here is the Jews are actually welled up in the palace of the bishop, in the fortress of the bishop. The bishop's guards are trying to protect them. And the crusader army is actually waging war against the bishop's guards, which t- turn out to be particularly soft. And, and they're overwhelmed. Thus the enemies entered the courtyard. In the courtyard they found Rabbi Isaac, the son of Moshe, and struck him with a sword's blow of death and destruction. This was besides the fifty-three souls who had fled with Rabbi Clonimus through the bishop's rooms, exiting to the room called the uh, Sinir, and remaining there. It was Tuesday, the third of Sivan, that the enemies entered the courtyard. A dark, lightless day, an overclass, gloomy day, darkness and the shadow of death shall sully it. God above shall not seek it, nor shall light shine upon it. Sun, moon, why have you not darkened your light? Stars to which the Jews are compared. Constellations, twelve like the sons of Yaakov. How can you not hide your light from the shining for the enemies who sought to erase the name of Israel? Inquire now and realize, has there ever before been so great a sacrifice, even since the days of Adam? When the members of the Holy Covenant saw that the decree was decreed and the enemies had won, they all cried out, Bachelors, the elderly, maidens, children, slaves, crying over the dead, and for their own lives, saying, We will, we will bear the yoke of his holy awe. For the enemies are killing us just a moment, and with the sword, the lightest of the four deaths, we will live spiritually in the Garden of Aden forever, in the sight of the great light. They all wholeheartedly and willingly said, After all, one cannot wonder about the way of God. Blessed are he and his name and the way God acts. We gave us, he gave us his Torah and therein commanded that we all allow ourselves to be killed. Put to death over the singleness of his holy name. How fortunate are we if we do his will and how fortunate is he who is slaughtered, killed over the, the singleness of his name. Not only does he merit afterlife sitting in the enclave of the world, maintaining uh, righteous, but he exchanges a world of darkness for a world of light, a world of trouble for a world of joy, a fleeting world for a world that lasts forever. They all cried out together in a loud voice. After all, we should not delay. The enemies are quickly approaching. Let us act, offering ourselves to our Father in heaven. Whoever has a knife, come kill us for the honor of the unique eternal God. And then pierce himself with his sword in his neck or belly or slaughter himself. They all stood, man and woman, and killed one another. Maidens, brides, grooms looked out of the windows and cried and saying, Look and see God, 
What are we doing for your honor so as not to exchange your godliness for a hung, crucified, dirty, abominable Nazarene, disgusting even in its own generation, a bastard, the son of the menstruate son of adultery? They all were slaughtered. The blood of the slaughter, the slaughterer flowed over the surface of the rooms in which the members of the Holy Covenant, they lay in rows, suckling with the hoary-headed, rattling in their throats, as do slaughtered sheep. Will you bear this, God, keeping silent our extreme suffering? May the spilled of your servants be avenged. Look, see, has there ever been such a thing that the people should push one another, each saying, I will be the first to honor by death the name of the king, the king over kings. And the pure women were throwing money out the windows to delay the enemies a bit until the women could slaughter their own children. The hands of the merciful women were strangling their children to do the will of their Creator, and were turning their children's tender faces to the Gentiles. When the enemies came to the room, they broke the doors and found the Jews still butchering, still twitching and rolling in their own blood. They took the Jews' money, stripped them naked, and smote the remaining ones, not leaving any remnant. This they did in all the rooms that they had members of the Holy Covenant. But there was one room that was strongly fortified. The enemies fought until evening to enter it. When the Holy Ones saw that the enemies were stronger than they, they stood up, men and women, and slaughtered the children. And then one another, some fell on their swords and died. Some were killed by their own swords or knives. The righteous women would toss rocks to the enemies outside the windows so the enemies could stone them. And they accepted all the stones thrown back until their entire flesh and face had become strips. They were abusing and insulting the crusaders regarding the name of the hung one, the disgrace, disgusting son of adultery in whom do you trust a trodden corpse and the crusaders approached the door to break it when they saw the slaughtered children they smote her killing her on top of them about her it was said a woman ruptured with her children she died atop of them as the righteous woman died on top of her seven children that's a reference to Chana and the Hanukkah story and about her it was said Aim habanim smecha. Um, a mother of children is happy uh, I, I could continue, but there's another. It, there's a, I have another page of text here about uh, tells detail about one woman named Rachel. Um, I'll put it up here in case people want to uh, um, to read it or or uh, go back when we record this and 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 read it fully. There's so much to say about this. First of all, the fact that this was written and recorded. Robert Chazen, the, the author of, uh, of this book, European Jew Jewry in the First Crusade, coins a term called the Epic of Defeat, where he says that the Jews in these chronicles squeeze out a, a victory, not a Pyrrhic victory, a real victory, the victory of, of martyrdom, of the story of their martyrdom, of their pure faith against the brutality of the Christians, that there's a sense of our our enduring heroism that comes out of even this moment where the Christians are attempting to crush us. We could also spend an entire day on the discussion of, wait a minute, I always thought that in Judaism there are three cardinal sins. And if someone says convert or die, they put a sword to you and say convert or die. So you take the sword but you're not allowed to kill yourself. When when are you ever allowed? When was it ever discussed that you're allowed to kill yourself in order to avoid, um, in in order to avoid, you know, the 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 temptation for, for idol worship. So this is a a, a tremendous scholarly debate. There's actually um, another book on this subject which is really very very interesting. It's called um, hold it up to my. Camera. It's called The Last Trial um, by, uh, by Sholem Spiegel. And it is about the fact that when you read through the Crusader Chronicles, they, they in a sense, they say to Avraham, you only offered to slaughter your child. We actually did it. Um, and, um, and then there are even others that suggest that, that, um, that Avraham actually slaughtered his one child. It is a fascinating piece that that they refer to a midrash, where Avram actually does slaughter Isaac and he's resurrected. 
the the reason that this is somewhat important is because you, you we see that there is an intellectual tradition that grows up in Ashkenaz in this area in a way it's a defense mechanism um, where they 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 see that the the Jews of the Crusades were exceedingly pious and they see that their actions are heroic and there are even writings of the Tosafot the writings of the of Rashi's grandsons which say that if this is what they did under the instruction of these holy rabbis it must be correct and they justify it based on the story of Shaul Shaul asks his armor bearer to take his life because he doesn't want to be tortured by the Philistines he doesn't want to be paraded around and so there is a an intellectual tradition that you are allowed to take your life to avoid being tortured uh, into betraying God. This re remains highly controversial. It was probably controversial then and certainly remains controversial now. I am, do not want to be in a place to judge our ancient ancestors in this situation. But the violence that was being visited upon them, we, this reaction is a reaction to extreme violence where they are being they are being put to the sword in order to convert and and they are literally getting um, uh, no no help or assistance from from the other Christians in these cities if if the Pope had originally thought that he was going to have a a, a disciplined army that was going to be put together under, under ecclesiastical control. That's not what he got. You know, this picture, um, not sorry, not that picture. Um, this picture, the picture on your right is a, is a painting by Auguste Mijet in 1850. And that is the, it depicts the massacre at Mines. This was a, an event of extreme violence, and it was probably generated by a multiplicity of factors. It was economic jealousy against successful Jewish merchants. There was a there was Christian anti-Semitism, and there was an undisciplined Christian army that was that was ramped up to to uproot the infidel. And there was such an evil picture that was painted of the Jew that made the kind of violence that inspires the, uh, the, uh, the narrative that you just heard that Jews were, were choosing between a certain death and to be able to control their own fate. And again, I don't want to judge anybody who and what they did there, but you can see that they they patterned their actions on a real sense of of be, willingness to to uh, accept death rather than betray their faith. The worst thing that they could do is betray their faith. Um, um, the, I'm already 45 minutes into a 30 minute class, so maybe our next um, our next discussion should really be about conver conversion um, and how it may have played out in this in this episode. But if I want to just summarize what I think is a is a takeaway, I think the takeaway that we have to appreciate is that Christianity in the Crusades becomes empire and it it goes to recapture its lands. And in recapturing its lands, it also comes to uproot Jewishness. Uh, it uproots Islam as well, but our story is the story of the Jews. And the I think it's just it's highly ironic that the accusation is that the Jews are the Jews who came in ninth in in the in the in the nineteenth and twentieth century were really European colonialists, because. You had an Arab conquest that that displaced them. You had a Christian con, you had a Roman conquest of displacement. The Roman Empire displaces them. Then you have the the Christians inheriting that Roman Empire. Then you have the the Arabs displacing those Christians, and then you have the Christians reasserting their empire, um, not only uprooting Jews but uprooting Jew, Jewishness, 
you know, all through the Mediterranean. Um, and, you know, this, the, the irony of this is just, is just, it's almost too much for me to bear in this, uh, in this story, because the violence, the, the proto, um, uh, Holocaust, um, is, is, is the Crusades. And you should know, by the way, this event was so scarring that, that we have a paragraph that we read every Shabbos. Most people have no idea that that's what it's about. We have a paragraph we read every Shabbat, the Avar Achamim, which is meant to be a memorial to the, the people of, of Speyer, Worms, Mines, and some other cities that were, that, that suffered this violence. Um, so anyway, that's a, that's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, so, uh, and